Welcome everyone. We are here to talk about exit planning today, exit planning in your business. We are joined by Ellen Long and Randy Long, and they specialize in consulting just on this topic. And we've done some capital gains planning for some of our clients on exit planning and aligning that with their real estate tax strategies and general tax strategies. And we always look at all sources of income, but I'm very excited to drill down on this, what can be a very complex, multifaceted topic with many strategies and variables to consider. So we're going to riff on this. We have some live people who can answer your questions. We'll have some conversation on this topic, uh, but let's get started. Randy and Ellen Long, can you each introduce yourselves in 60 seconds or less? 60 seconds. So um, I was a lawyer first. I practiced law for 30 years. I own a wealth management firm still in California. And I spend almost all of my time in my exit planning consulting company, which is the most fun that you can imagine. And um, and I get to do it with my daughter, which makes it extremely exciting. And we love the outcomes that the people get. It's really fun. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Ellen Long, I actually started in insurance, so selling insurance to business owners. And then I went and got my MBA, worked for a couple of business consultants, and dad and I joined forces about nine years ago. So we've been building, proving, and selling companies now for, well, he's been doing it for decades, but me for about 10 years and agreed. It's been an awesome experience. The results that we've had from entrepreneurs selling their business for you know five times what they thought, 10 times what they thought, and the impact it can have on families and employees has been a really cool journey. Yeah. Awesome. So we're going to start off with some high level foundational questions here to get our juices flowing. And hopefully we'll keep our audience as we progress into some questions and nitty gritty stuff here. So high level here, let's talk about what are the most, you know, so this is an area that we see so often that people come to us after the sale or, you know, a week before the sale or whatever. We're, and, and, you know, there's a lot of playing to be done here. And I, sometimes I've found myself having conversations that should have taken place six months or a year ago. What are some foundational things you see people missing in their exit planning or lack of exit planning? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a couple of early things here in that uh, the idea of how long can, um, how far in advance should you plan for your exit? Uh, I think you should be planning your exit when you start the company, or if that's not possible, as soon thereafter as possible. I also think that some of the great parts, because we do exit plan. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but real quick, if you or anyone you know is interested in using our services or joining our team, email info at markperlbergcpa.com. That's info at markperlbergcpa.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Planning on a very macro level, uh, wider than any anybody I've ever seen, frankly. And so for, for business owners, if you have the size of a company uh, or net worth that's going to end up being taxed by, by the estate taxes one day, and you know that's a moving target, the unified credits change incredibly over the course of my career. But I can tell you that the earlier planning you do uh, towards that, um, if you're intending to have uh, what I'll call family legacy kind of wealth, then then you're behind if you're not already in it, way into it already. So, that's, so, that's, so that's the, real early is what I'm saying. What are some of these early action items we can do to set us up for future success on the exits? Well, one uh, of the major ones I would say is your team. So having a team uh, that an accounting team, a legal team, and some sort of business coach exit planner that can help guide you along the way. It's the same thing as any professional athlete is going to have a coach, a general manager. There's a whole organization behind the professional athletes. And we think of entrepreneurs like athletes, right? You're the athlete getting on the field, playing the game, making the scores, making it all happen. But having a team, and I think one of the reasons we love working with accountants like Mark is you have to have a really good team behind you to help you. Um, I love, I think it's Keith Cunningham's begin with the end in mind, but that idea of, you know, and don't, don't do anything stupid. You know, he's got that, the road less stupid, I think it's his book, right. but Hello. the idea is that you can make decisions along the way that can really impact the end because 
from our perspective, the end is you're selling a story. Uh, number one, you're, you want to sell a story to multiple buyers. We always say if you have one buyer, you have no buyer, which means if you're only selling, so often we see this private equity companies, c- competitors. I just talked to a woman who sold to her to her competitor and she was like, oh, we had a great exit, all this stuff. And in my mind, I'm thinking you had a competitor buy your company, no other buyers, and the competitor set the price. What kind of price do you think that competitor set? It wasn't the best price for her. So when you think about the end is you're really selling the story, what we try to do is how can we build a really good story? How can we prove that? So, you know, we'll do quality of earnings. We'll do all sorts of things to make sure that when we get to that buyer and the buyer is going to do that due diligence on your company, aka go through everything in your company, every document, every process, every procedure, uh, we want that story to be able to be proven to the buyers that you have, not just the buyer. So I think of it, you know, people people ask, oh, when should I start? And really the question is, when do you want to be living that really good story? If you think about it in terms of real estate, for example, if you said, I want to sell my house, well, you can sell your house as is, or you can decide to upgrade the kitchens, upgrade the bathrooms, right? There are certain things that you can do to make your house more valuable. What we do is we come in and say, Here's the five things that would make your business more valuable. Here's the resources you need to make that happen. Here's the strategy because this is what a buyer is looking for. So I imagine a lot of these things that you do to maximize the sales price of this business and the exit would be things that you also would want to do if you were never to sell it. So, right? Like we want to have the friend processes. We want to make sure this business is not reliant on one individual. We want to eliminate you know, tackle our bottlenecks here. We need to make this a system that can function without the owner president. So, and, and a lot of owners, you know, one of their, some of their greatest downfalls is that they're stuck doing all the roles. So it's, it may not be a business, it's just something that they do and they're really just self-employed. Mm-hmm. And so I imagine a lot of sophisticated business owners are doing, you know, the ones who are, a lot of them are going to be very likely to be incentivized to do these things uh, for not only for the, the, a successful exit, but for uh, things like to have a sustainable business so they can take time off, they can maximize profitability, grow, focus on the things that they most enjoy. Is that? Yeah, we, we used to do what, you know, years and years and years ago, um, early on, I used, to, I used to have kind of different processes depending on whether the people were going to sell to an insider, so an employee, or if we were going to transition it to the kids, or if we were going to sell it to a third party. I kind of had different processes, but over the years, I've come to the strong and firm conclusion that we always want to prepare for a third party sale. Because once we prepare for a third party sale, uh, everything works better, everything's worth more, uh, the owner's peace of mind, every everybody and everything is happier. And it also opens up all the options. So you, if, you, if you've got a company that's prepared for a third-party sale, it, it runs easier, it's worth more, and you can leave it to the kids, you can transition it to an insider, you can do all these possibilities still exist. And on top of that, a lot of, a lot of times what you see is, you know, the parents think the kids are going to take over, or they think an employee is going to buy it, and then it just falls through, and then they're stuck having to prepare for third-party sale again, which is a lot more prep frankly, but uh, you're right, Mark, do it right and do it well. And, and a lot of, I would say too, probably over the course of my career, I'd say maybe 20% of the businesses that come, that have come to us for either a sale or, or a transition of some sort, they decide to keep the business in the family yep. because they're like, well, if we've done all this work and, it, and the company is running so well and it's so profitable, why would we get rid of it now? You know, kind of a thing. So your your point is well taken. Yeah. So and the so foundational things having reliable books, having a, a way that you're assessing KPIs and understanding the profitability in your books, having some sort of economy of scale where you under you can have some sort of predictability and the profitability of the business. All these things are going to make it so that this is more of an asset. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have many business owners and, and many business owners in my profession who are just grinding their hearts out and and then one day they just give up or die and 
They just said, I can't do this anymore. And then they try to sell off their clients. And that's probably on the other side of what you don't want to be doing here. You need to pretty much, you know, in a way, hire yourself out of a job. So this thing is a fully running mechanism without you in it. So, yeah, and I would say, you know, we work with a lot of investment banks. And the one thing that you don't want to tell an investment bank is, I'm really tired and I don't want to do this anymore. (laughs) That's the worst answer, right? Because what does that say to a buyer? Well, I can squeeze money out of you because you're done. And if you're done, that means when I, the grind of selling your company, because it is a grind to sell your company. It takes a lot of extra time, energy, emotions. My goodness, it's an emotional roller coaster to sell your business. And when you get to the, it, the finish line, if the buyer knows that there's no way you're stepping away from this deal, they we've ha- we had this happen in a deal last year where the buyer two days before the close of the business came back and said, actually, I decided I'm going to take $2 million off the table. It wasn't a huge sale. So $2 million is a big portion. And they felt like, oh, these are old clients. They're not going to want to do this process again. But we had multiple buyers. And yep. so we said to them, we we told our clients, they asked us, what, what should we do? And us as a team said, you should tell him, absolutely no way. We're going to find another buyer if that's what you want to do. Yep. And that's what we did. We went back to him and said, absolutely no way. And actually, because of that, our clients got $2 million more in cash versus the seller's note because of that. So the so if you do it right and they know, no, we could keep this business because at that point, they're working 20, you know, 25 hours a week. Their business is super profitable. It was getting better every single year. And we had buyers in the back. So we said, we'll go to another buyer or we'll keep the business, but there's no way you're going to shaft us at the end. And so many buy, so many sellers, sorry, get shafted in the end because they're not ready for that. Or they just close their business down. Like you were talking about, Mark, some of the guys, because I talked to a guy about two years ago now. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but real quick, if you or anyone you know is interested in using our services or joining our team, email info at Mark Perlberg cpa.com that's info at mark perlberg cpa.com all right let's get back to the show i met him on a plane and he uh had run an electrical electrician firm a good sized one and he wasn't even he wasn't even really working hardly at all he was 72 or something and so i said well uh he said yeah I, i got rid of my i said well i hope you did well he said well what do you mean i said well Hope you got a good price. He said, well, I didn't get a good, uh, I, I just closed it down. I, I didn't want to go through this whole, the whole mess of having to sell. I said, well, how much money did you take home like last year? Like just how much did you, it, just profit did you take home? He said, well, a little over, a little over a quarter million dollars. And I was like, well, it may not be the biggest business in the world, but even if you add a two multiple to that, it's still money that would have been really nice to have. I mean, a lot of these, they just close the companies down. It's amazing how many of these I run into. So, and you do have this problem, you know, where people will, they'll, they'll build a business where they're kind of too big to be big and too small to be small. And then they, they kind of wring their hands. They don't know what to do. And we end up with a lot of those kind of businesses, honestly, that we pick up and we work with to, to grow them and then sell them that that's, that's a, at least a decent part of what we do anyway. So this is, you know, it it kind of reminds me of what I've seen with our clients where, you know, real estate is a very sexy thing to do. Mailbox money, it looks really glamorous. But when they realize, oh, I got this deal and I find it, I now have a half a million dollars in assets and another 1.5 in equity, I'm rich. And then you realize you really just bought yourself a job and that job may really suck. Yeah, (laughs) you have to deal with. Evicting people, picks and worrying about broken toilets and people stealing stuff. And yeah. all of a sudden, this the sexiness of being an investor isn't so much so. And uh, and then I more and more as I become a business owner, I realize the most powerful thing you can do as a leader or business owner is, is to mobilize a team to do stuff, to do things as a group and empower a group of people aligned together accomplishing stuff. Now, mm-hmm. I'm wondering, so how do you, now I'm wondering how do you get these people? So, so let's say they're, they're too deep in the weeds. There's no processes or 
what resources are you doing to turn these businesses around so it goes from something that's profitable and had a lot of good stuff going on to being something that could be more self-sufficient than that can be handed off to another person. What are you guys doing with these people? Do you want me to do it or you want to? Yeah, someone? go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. add as you go. So a couple of things here. Um, one of these is one of the value catalysts that I in my book talks about um, building a stable and motivated management team. So you've got to have, you got to build a management team to extricate yourself and divide your, if you will, divide your workload off and you know, into other people taking more and more of your job, essentially, until you're not needed anymore and you've built, you've built a great team. Um, also, too, looking at um, processes and things. So uh, one of the companies that we sold uh, last year, um, we had worked with the family. It was kind of a small company, and we worked with the family for about four years before we sold it. But one of the early things that we did, the owners – we're both husband and wife. We're both working 60, 70 hours a, a week. I mean, and they, you know, were at that point in time, they were late sixties. And so they're working themselves hard and they were getting tired. Of, and so we basically brought in um, a process engineer. We figured out kind of early that the owner, the guy that was running the company was actually, he was, he was the bottleneck and we couldn't grow the company because everything was stopping at him. So we basically brought in a process engineer, redesigned the front end, hired somebody to take a good part of his work, and the company exploded, like exploded. So understanding, uh, you know, building your processes, procedures, understanding profitability, like, uh, and Ellen could talk about profitability analysis, that sort of thing. I'll, I'll let you take over here, Ellen. Go ahead. Yeah, and I would just say, we think people process profit, so... Yeah. When you talk about people, leadership, really, one of my mentors says leadership is the product. That's what you're building. You're building leaders in your company. And if your company is built by leaders, for leaders, you're going to have a really efficient, amazing company, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one of his things is build your management team into leaders. We're not trying to make the entrepreneur, you know, oh, we don't need the entrepreneur anymore. No, what we're trying to do is a management team that runs the day-to-day -day business and the entrepreneur is focusing on strategy, on big deals, on like uh, Randy actually had a farming client who put a management team in place and he went around the world finding different varieties, different fruits. He created a lot of the new creations of fruits that you see in the grocery stores of, of mixes of fruits together is his creation because he found a management team that run, would run the farming operations day to day. So he could travel the world finding new varieties, new combinations. All Nobody else was doing that. So our our job is to try to make the entrepreneur more valuable, not less valuable. And so many of them come and they're like, I don't want to be irrelevant in my company. I built this company. This is my baby. And we're and our job is not to make you irrelevant. Our job is to make you so much more valuable than you are and to build a management team into leaders so that they're running your company and they're building leaders underneath them. So if and also incentivize. So part of this is one of the things we try to do is understand the profitability of your company. Where is the profit coming from? If we can maximize that and tie management incentives to that and incentives even in, in the whole company to that, now all of a sudden we're we're moving in the same direction with the same team. And I think uh, entrepreneurs getting, a lot of times what we see is they have one or two people in their management team that probably shouldn't be there. They should have fired them a long time ago, but there's some sort of loyalty or you know there's something that's keeping that person there. Maybe they don't want to find a new person, but it's really you know, do you have the right butts in the right seats for your management team is really important as we go through the next three years. And we like to tie, um, we'll do, you know, either whether it's stay bonuses or some sort of incentive on the sale too. So if you decide to sell, your management team gets a huge win in the end. We're not trying to make, you know, we just talked to a guy yesterday and he, and he said, I know you guys are representing me, but I really want to take care of my people. No, our job isn't to you know, pit you against your employees. Our job is that your employees are so excited that we're here because their job is better. They're making more money. Everybody is winning. Yep. Well, I gets a lot bigger. So, so you know, and I think about, um, and, and even in our profession, a lot of people, they have, they get, they develop all these wonderful ideas in tax planning and insights, but then they have this, which I think is a very foolish notion that only they can do it. Oh, yeah, I need to get into the tax plan. I'm not at all taxes because that's all me. And I'm like, 
why would you want to deprive your staff of learning all of these exciting things and giving them ownership in the success? And so, so we just introduced a revenue sharing model uh, and we do about maybe 30 hours of professional development a year. I'm hiring, by the way. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and and I think that, that um, when I think about my value as a person and my savings, I could put money in a 401k, which to me is boring because I'm an entrepreneur, but I would rather invest into my team and build them in our systems because this is an asset that gets more favorable tax treatment, capital gains treatment, and that I can grow and get better ROI investing into my people and my team and my resources for the business. Yeah, the the other piece about that, you're right, by the way. I, I like that. I like that uh, point. Um, the other thing we we're talking about in the, the leader is true for everybody else in the business, really. We're also, Mark, you're familiar with the unique ability um, work that Dan Sullivan has done a bunch of. And so we apply that unique ability piece um, to the leadership team. Basically, we want everybody doing what they're really built to do and and that they love to do. And so part of part of the study it has to do with understanding, you know, what they are super good at and they're super gifted at and they really love it. And then we slice everything as much as possible away from them. And then we put people in places where they love to do the parts that they do. And so it's a matter of sort of dividing up responsibilities and taking things off of, for instance, the boss, you, you know, we want to take things off of him first that he hates and that he's no good at. And a lot of bosses are no good at a good part of what they do. So there's some simple concepts like that, which we apply to all the cases we work on. Yeah. And I, I love what you're talking about investing, putting aside a certain percentage of your business revenue to reinvest back into yourself as an entrepreneur, but also in, into the team. Because, you know, if you're going to hire a financial advisor, they might charge you, you know, 7,500 basis points to manage the money. Let's think of it the same way. Take your business, reinvest, not just in the operations of the business, but in the people. I love that idea of thinking of your people as an investment instead of an expense, because the better your people, right, you're going to have an exponential return if your people are exponentially better. So mm -hmm. I love that idea of reinvesting. Um, and, and like you know, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs um, and you don't get rich. Most people don't get rich by a 401k, right? They get yeah. wealthy because they invest in a business and a business takes you to those levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when that 401k, you eventually do, I mean, we can do some things, but, you know, without a plan, and if you're going to be like the masses, you take that money out, you pay taxes at your marginal rate. And this, it could accumulate and be a ticking time bomb without the right, without yeah. the right planning. I'm not saying don't do it. You know, there's so many variables to consider here. Sure. Uh, so, so I'm guessing you guys went to strategic coach. I, I did. did do a couple of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because I did. I did My five. Or... I'm trying to. Re I recommended it to him. I think he's on the fence still. Yeah, I did five or seven years of it. I can't remember which, but uh, and then I went to Genius from there. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. So, so now, so I think I have a good. You know, obviously, there's a lot of stuff you guys do, uh, but I think I have a a decent understanding of the process of building this business into something that can that is an organization and not dependent on the leader which therefore makes it more profitable and appealing. Now, and this is probably where, at yeah, the point where we may lose the attention span of some of the general listers, but <laughs> the eyebrows might, the ears might perk up for my CPA listeners and about half of the audience that listens to this stuff is, is other CPAs. At the end. But so, so we got, Hey, sorry to interrupt, but real quick, if you or anyone you know is interested in using our services or joining our team, email info at markperlbergcpa.com. That's info at markperlbergcpa.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Listen, so we have a strong valuation. We have strong systems. This thing is a self-sustaining, high-functioning, high-powered business. And we're going to put it on the market now. Now, what I'm wondering here is, what, tell me about some of the conversations and negotiations you have on structuring the, the sale of some of these businesses. 
Well, l let me clarify. When you're, are you asking about the negotiation um, as we're putting together the deal first with the the M&A firm and then we are going to market? Is that you talking about that process? Or are you talking about at the actual point of sale, uh, some of the things that we might be asking for um, based on the, you know, the, I guess, based on the tax issues? Is this a tax question? Is that, that's where I'm going. Is this a tax it, question it, or is it a process question? It's a little bit of both. So, okay. All okay. right. Yes. And maybe, uh, maybe I don't know what I was asking here. Okay. <laughs> well, let, let me, I tell you what, let's just start with sort of the M&A process because most people have never gone through an M&A deal. Like yeah. very few actually have. So, um, yeah, in, in general for us, when we believe our clients are ready to go, then we will reach out and we will we'll, uh, find the M&A provider we want to do business with, we'll negotiate the deal, and then we will start the process through. And so the process of what well, I've been talking a lot, Ellen, just- I know, I, I actually welcome. think, go way back. If we go way back, what we actually talk about tax way before we get to you, you want to sell your company. Our goal is that yeah. you have all those structures in place before you get to that place. Like, you know, we're, we start talking about 1202. You got to do that five years before you have to make sure. So either you're qualified if, or you're not you're either qualified or you're not. We talk about 1202. We do, we also help in the process of estate planning. We're not estate planners per se in that we draft the documents, but we're talking about estate planning issues way before. So, you know, we might do some creative tax structures before we get to that point. So We've been talking about how to build your company inside the company, but we're also working on the outside, which is how can we maximize the tax savings at the time of sale? A lot of those strategies you have to do years before, and that's part of Randy's point on when should you start thinking about this. And you know, there's some very complex tax and estate strategies that can save a lot of money at time of sale. But if you wait till the moment that the sale happens and you're only you know, at that point, you're only negotiating asset sale versus stock sale. Well, now we've missed a lot of opportunities along the way to do some interesting structures and try to save them money beforehand. So our goal is when you get to that place, we're not just arguing with the buyer and negotiating with the buyer about what kind of deal it's going to be. We've already, we already have tax structures in place. So the business owner is going to win before we get to that point. Yeah. And we're just to be clear, we're not, we're not the tax planners, uh, be, so we, you know, the CPA world is doing the planning. We're not technically doing the planning just to be, but we are uh, very large issue spotters. Let's put it that way. Um, because I, I did used to do estate planning for 25 years for my clients and, and I did draft the document. So I don't, uh, I, I have a lot more than a rudimentary, rudimentary knowledge of what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, so to Ellen's point, the, the beginning, the structure side of it, negotiating even between the the various owners and and allocating, you know, to fix it. Because a lot of times when we, when we come into deals, there's structural problems at the bottom, you know, how they set it up or the deal between the the parties. Maybe there's two or three shareholders and there's sometimes we're brought in at that level because there's conflict. They want to save the company, but they don't know how. And sometimes that's our entry into the into the beginning of the sales process is we go in and we resolve the the structural problems that the businesses have. So the the exit planning piece, the way we do it is not just, okay, we're going to sale. Now how do we get the most money at sale? That that's not what we do. It's part of what we do. And it's a big, you know, it's it's what makes the payoff good. But there's a lot of stuff that, you know, goes on before that to get everything clean and clear. And that's back to Ellen's point earlier about the team. We have to have uh, we have to have a good team. The other thing that that I've learned over the years, both being a lawyer, and this is true of the lawyers, of the accountants, and what, that too, too often the professionals, you know, we're silo driven. You know, I'm one of, I'm I'm all about the tax stuff, and I got my head down. I'm do the tax, or I'm all about the estate planning, but but we uh, we try to um, we try to be really proactive ahead. And, and get the team together and start working on this stuff instead of waiting for, because too often, the, uh, look, I was a lawyer. I, I, I had a, a fairly large number of clients to deal with, like 2,000 of them or something. And you can't think, you can't spend a lot of time thinking about every every client's 
you know, business all the time. And so by, by necessity, unfortunately, in the professions, we turn out to be transactional too often. So it's, it's really important to get the team together and start getting everybody to focus and um, get the best ideas and get the, get the issues resolved early so that when we're going forward, you know, everybody is united. Let's put it that way. Oh, absolutely. So we talked about 1202. You, you touched on the 1202 exclusion, which is really cool. And now it's like when you think about these mats of transactions on capital gains events, it, you know, you may have an exit where you're selling in a profits in the tens of millions, but sometimes because of the opportunities involved in favorable tax treatment and flexibility of capital gains, you may find that the seller may actually pay less taxes than they have in the past when this transaction occurs. That's and right. to the 1202, it has to be with a C Corp. So maybe you just decide to keep it as a C Corp instead of an S Corp. It yeah. has to be a C Corp for what we call substantially all of the time that is a business and for at least five years. And substantially all isn't really clearly defined, but mm-hmm. you look at the court cases where we're saying like around 80% of the time, there's there's no real clear definition of this substantially all word here, but you can exclude up to ten million dollars of capital gains on the transaction and per person. That's per shareholder. Yeah. So per shareholder up to five shareholders. So that's up to fifty million. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So imagine gifting some of the shares to your family now. Talk about tax savings. Correct. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Planning. Getting that early work, uh, that early work done to, and you know, to, for the CPAs, I know that, and it's there is some foresight that's required on the 1202 side, and I know also too, looking back over my career, you know, with what the IRS does, sometimes you want it to be a C corp, sometimes you want it to be an S corp, and they kind of move you through this, and sometimes you know, long, long time ago, it was better to have assets, real estate owned inside of your C corp. I mean, this was like way back in my career, and so the IRS does crazy things to planning, as we all know, because of their stu- their stupid incentive. But um, that's what was I going to say? Uh, I was going to make a point. Oh, gosh, I, I hate that. And then they switched to the uh, C corp. The twelve, yeah, the right, the corp, the um, the accountants, they have to be able to have some foresight, and not just presume that all of these companies, these small companies that come to you and start and all that, that they should they should be S corps, right? So if if they're going to understand in the back of your mind, what are the type of companies that are going to qualify for, um, for twelve oh two anyway? Those, what kind of companies is that? So if they don't fit into that, then of course an S corp is a great choice and all. But just thinking, you know, ahead with your people, and the same thing for lawyers. I mean, I I don't think not too many people are considering Section twelve hundred two at the startup of a company. Well, yeah, you know, I, I so often see this. I call this when we have these attorneys who are misadvising their clients, and sometimes they show up to these fancy conferences where that they already know the audience is probably not the brightest if they're overpaying for like not very good information. And they, before they review your goals, your financial, the profitability, they just say active income, escort, end of discussion, my work is done, maybe $5,000 and go back this entity in Las Vegas, uh, even though you you don't have any assets for, to protect. Uh, and, and so I call, I call that premature application. Yeah. Um, premature application of the entities. And, uh, you know, what, so some of the things like if you, if you have a tech startup where where your your assets, your intellectual capital, like a video game company, or we see a lot of these companies where they know the exit may be like 10, 20 times their investment. And we often see the C Corp being such a valuable way to structure these things. That's yeah, and I, would, I would say a lot of it is just also to the business owners to tell your accountants and your lawyers what your goals and what your plans are, because you know, it may be income wise an escort better is better, you know, seek, but you want to sell in five years, maybe in 1202. So helping your advisors help you, because again, they're only going to know what you tell them. And so we had a case where the father wanted to transition to his son. And so he brought us in to help with the transition. He'd been working for his CP- with his CPA for 20 years. They were like, but you know, really good friends, worked with the company for 20 years. 
we're in a meeting together and the father says to the CPA, I want to leave in two years. And the CPA almost fell out of his chair. He's like, what? I've never heard you say that. I had no idea that was your goal and your plan. So part of this is, you know, one, finding the right team, but two, also telling your team, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. How do we build that structure? How do we, you know, and part of what we do is bring all these advisors into one space in one room and actually have these conversations where the lawyer is giving the legal advice, the accountant's giving the account advice, and we can create a plan and a structure with all of those people together, which often never happens for business owners. I mean, most of the clients that we work with have never had their team in the same place in the same time. Yeah. And it is nice for an owner to listen to um, the discussion between, you know, the, the lawyer and the accountant and um, especially early on um, because they, they, unfortunately it's true. They don't, they don't tend to be in the same room. Of course, some of ours, we work around the country, so ours aren't always in the same room, but at least on the same Zoom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, but it is it is wonderful early on to get everybody on the same page, and then also to have like we have a number of, of experts that we use over the years. That like we have a we have a lawyer that we do business with that is a that is a twelve hundred two expert. That's like his specialty. So just knowing um, being able to have um, you know, a good uh, network is a very big deal in what we do, which of course uh, is super important because there's so many different types of professionals that we will, that we can use and have used over the course of the different, you know, um, clients that we've had. And so, you know, it's uh, the having somebody also that you're working with somewhere on that team that has a broad vision to help you. That's. And I would whoever, say people have, yeah, people have their specialties. One thing we see a lot is a business owner will use, he really likes this one lawyer. And so that lawyer does his estate planning, his real estate work, his, right? And you're trying to see, wait a second, this guy probably isn't an expert in all those things because each of those areas are specific. And so one of the things we try to do is make sure that whoever is speaking on that subject is a, truly an expert in that. So just because you like this person doesn't mean they're the best person for that particular part. They might be doing it because... They think they're, you know, they're helping you or, you know, you, you asked them to do it. So therefore they do it. But, you yeah. know, a lot of times we want to make sure that whoever you're using is really an expert in that topic. Yeah. I, I have a, some, a couple of bad stories about um, CPA firms that we asked the, the business owner to, um, to fire. And, you know, sometimes Mark, we, people, we, as professionals, we get to this place where we work, we work at a certain level in a certain, you know, like we're comfortable in it. So um, for me, I did not like to, I did not like to work on companies worth north of like a hundred million. If, if I went m above that, I it would just, I just would always co-counts with other firms, right? It was just, I always did just to protect my client. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say for the CPA firms and the law firms the same way that you know, being careful to work in the things that you're really gifted in, in the space you're really, you're really good at. So one of the, the CPAs um, firm, but this was in, um, well, I won't say where it was, but one of our clients, a, a decent company that, that, that was growing pretty good, you know, um, I had, I had asked for three years in a row and I put, and I made them put it in the minutes to get rid of the, the CPA firm because I could tell they were not keeping up. I could just see it in their eyes. I could feel it. I could tell by their questions. And uh, and this guy went to high school with the CPA. He was a buddy of his. And so he wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And then um, we ended up uh, getting an, an audit notice. The, the uh, billing entity wanted $4 million. And so I hired a tax attorney. Again, me, I'm, I'm on their behalf because I'm working. So I hired... A tax attorney on their behalf, he does the the work, and and then we call a meeting with the CPA firm and the tax attorney and the family, and we're all sitting around this huge table, and this the tax attorney, I, I set up the meeting, I ask him to to deliver his his um, um findings, his outcome, yeah, his findings, and so he says, uh, it's it's extremely clear that unfortunately your CPA firm has malpracticed you, and I can prove that very easily. 
could so would you please excuse them so we can get a, get about finding a good firm and defending you and that's what happened and part of it it, it was a simple relatively simple thing but uh, but at the end of the day it still cost my client a million and a half dollars even after a negotiation on the well, you know we ended up paying a million and a half bucks and he wouldn't get rid of it. and fortunately like I said I put it in the minutes every year for three years so just know that when you're dealing with people, if you're a CPA firm yourself, be comfortable in your lane, but be careful about going way outside of it because you're not doing yourself a favor or them. Yeah. Well, well, we could have, you know, people come to us because of the real estate strategies. That's what we know and we always do. And we've, we've encountered instances of business sales and we've considered, well, you know, it can exit planning can be complex and extensive. And then I consider, is this in our lane or, you know, because some of these transactions are significant, but then I realized just about every advisor has to at least have some form of plan in place if they're serving entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because even if you're doing the foundational basic stuff, the clients, a lot of these clients are going to eventually want to sunset out of their careers. So there are at least some foundational things that most people don't know and everyone should be thinking about with these with the exit plan. Yeah. And what's really exciting for us that we've found as we've advised on more and more of these transactions and been getting into some deeper and deeper and, and more significant things as we expand into this area is with real estate, it creates a whole world of planning opportunities. So, so one of the first things we ever ask is, what do you do with the cash and what are your plans after the exit? And if there's real estate involved, we could have some fun. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And and again, and I'm not a, I'm not a true real estate expert. So uh, I would always co-counsel um, myself. And I would say, you know, same thing for you guys. When you're working outside your, ex your area, co-counsel, bring somebody else in and help you work on it. And then you can keep the client that way. But... Uh, yeah, it's uh, real estate offers things that are unique to it. Let's put it that way. O opportunities and a screw up also can cost you. So um, I have a report. I could tell a lot of stories, Mark. I've been doing this a long time, both legal screw ups and accounting screw ups. I have. <laughs> but I love your foresight there because we always ask business owners too, what are you going to do after you sell? Because we've seen this happen a lot where their whole, their identity, their networks, their friendships, everything is tied to being a business owner. So I love your thought on that pro planning with the money after the sale. And we also like to say, not only what are you doing with your money after the sale, but what are you doing after your sale? Because we want them to go to something, not just from something. What What's going to keep you active and engaged and excited about life after you sell this company? Now, usually there's some sort of, you know, three to six months where they stay on and help the company transition. But after that, then what? Because, you know, we've seen people get uh, not our clients because we always have this conversation, but we have seen business owners who sell their companies get really depressed at about six months because yeah. they've traveled the world, they've done whatever they wanted to do, and all of a played sudden- Played a lot they, of golf. Played a lot of golf, and they've <laughs> lost their purpose and their value, and they're wondering, why? what am I doing? Why Why did I sell my company? And then they have all this regret. I shouldn't have sold my company. I, I don't have anything to go to. And the best people that we see, the, the ones that have the most fun, that enjoy it the most, they know what they're going to. Yeah, they do. Even if it's just charity, even if it's just being on the board of charities and helping nonprofits and have a plan, have something that you're going to. Yep. And, and when I think about this from a tax perspective, well, what are you going to do with the cash? Because if that cash is going to go to buy a beach house and just enjoy yourself and pay for your you know, for your living expenses, you might need to be a little more resourceful in your tax money. If you don't have the benefits of something like an ESOP or a 1202, we might need to think about how can we deploy this cash in a way to mitigate the tax burden here. And this is not just long-term cap gains we're talking about. If, if a lot of these are asset sales and you may be surprised that you're going to be paying taxes at your ordinary rate, even with an installment sale, you're going to get hit in the head with all a bunch of taxes at that ordinary rate. So we then now if you're gonna so if you're not in deploying the business assets or other investment vehicles like 
qualified opportunity zone funds and things like that. Well, then we got to figure out at least something that's tax advantage we're going to do with this cash. And on the other side of the spectrum, some of these folks are just going to say, well, I'm going to put it right back into other stuff and other assets and other things that are to qualify for bonus depreciation. And sometimes we find that with what the direction they're going in, we may find them because some of the cash on the transaction is the return of their basis. We may find that they're in a really good stance just with maybe making some tweaks here and there, but with their planes, they're, they're setting themselves up for a really good tax advantage situation. Yeah. 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 And I would say too, you know, one thing that we like to do is we almost do almost like a after sale investment policy statement. The idea of, you know, where are we putting this money? How is it going to be allocated? What sort of risks are we willing to take? We have seen business owners who are like, oh, I'm amazing at business. So I'm going to put a ton of money into startups and I'm going to become an angel investor, a venture capitalist and all those things. And you can lose a lot of money. I'm sure there's people on this call who have lost a lot of money in angel investing. You know, one out of 10 is a grand slam and you're doing really well. So just thinking through what am I willing to risk? What's my risk appetite and not also, as entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are risk takers. We love we love taking risks. It's it's part of our persona. But there's a difference between taking a risk in your company where you have control, you can change that outcome, right? Versus investing in other companies where you have a lot less control and it really is can be much higher risk. So making sure that they're not also selling their company and then losing a bunch of that money because they don't have a risk portfolio sort of idea so really thinking through that is important and it does come off sometimes i think we get a little bit proud we get a big exit you know we're pr pretty thumping our chest a little bit there and then we think to ourselves well i did that well that means that this next thing i'm going to do over here i'm going to do well too even though he has no experience in that field and so he gets uh he get fleeced over there by people that know what they're doing um, that's one thing. So they can lose a lot of the capital. The other thing, too, which is a great shock to some people, uh, which is how much it costs them to live after they sell their company. Because and this is a, a place that the CFPs or the or the accountants, whoever's whoever's helping with the tax side needs to do some actual like modeling for them to help them understand what it's really going to cost them to live after they lose the ability to you know, get the, have the car and the phones deducted and the, the pension plan and the insurance paid for and on and on and on and on. And uh, and then also, you know, factoring in like what kind of numbers do they need for growth of the capital or, or is so the more they have, the less risk they need to take if they're just taking care of themselves anyway. But somebody needs to do some modeling for them to give them a sense of what the truth is going to be after that sales done instead of them having to discover it. Yeah, and we always say, you know, it's a totally different skill set to live out of a cash flowing company and a net worth portfolio, right? Those are two very different skills. And so helping entrepreneurs think through that is also important. Yeah, very much so. And some of these investment vehicles are going to give you that cash flow advantage. Others will give you the growth and equity, which is maybe good for leaving a legacy for your family, but are you going to need to deploy these proceeds into something that you can live on or something that you could just have a wealth building vehicle. Like some qualified opportunity zone funds are just all about the exit. Uh, we we have we know people organizing ones where they're, they're telling you up front, we're gonna just reinvest all the proceeds back into this asset that'll sell tax free in 10 years. Well, if you're 75, you may not, who knows if you, you got another 10 years. Uh, yeah. And, and then we even know of, you know, obviously there's tons of other investment vehicles that are going to give the clients reliable and tax advantage cash flow. So there's a whole, there's a whole world of stuff to think about. And sometimes the clients, they, and we're not even authorized to tell them what to invest in everything. But I, I really think the answer is, it's a total cop out, but it depends, it depends on the DNA interest and what, what's interesting to the client on what they're going to put their money into. It does. But I, to Ellen's point, building buckets, you know, uh, in that investment policy statement, identifying some, I'll call it the uh, the pieces that are sort of defensive that you can essentially fall back on if things don't go the way you hope. And then the part where if you're, it, it also depends, like you said, on, on how young you are. Are you starting another company? 
are you just going to live on the money till you retire? You have so much that we need to, we need, and, and we, we would have been way ahead of this, but, but that you need to start dealing with the fact that you're going to have an incredible estate tax upon your debts. And, you know, there's just a lot of different, that's why the whole investment policy statement and, and, and working with somebody that knows what the heck that they're doing on all of these big issues, because they're very complex and they're unique to each person. This is what people ask us all the time, do, you know, well, what, you know, exit planning, just give me your steps. Well, my steps, I have a basic book. Here's my bulletproof your exit book, right? It's that little thing is written for, it's only like a hundred pages written for the owner to make it, to make it uh, clear what their overview is for everybody. But that's not the same thing as every, every client that we have and every deal that we do, every single one of them is different and has unique things to it. So you just can't plug things in and expect to, you know, to get everything to pop out right just by following, you know, four easy steps or whatever. That's why you need a good team to work with you along the way. Well, yeah. And, and I, when I think about tax planning, I, I always say that each client has their own DNA. Like they do. Very unique DNA of what plans will resonate with them. Be some liquidity, risk tolerance, what they want to do with their cash, you know. All of these things, there, there's no one is not is never going to be one answer. I mean, we could have, we, if we had the time, we could have just broken off into another two hour long session on life insurance and infinite banking and annuities. <laughs> so, hey, there's so much to get to here. <laughs> you know, more more money, more problems. No, <laughs> more money, more options though. And so the the more money there is, the more options they have to do with it, and that just makes it's just more complexity. So having a yeah. team that can help you. That's it's right. Important. Too often you you get these things yeah. and you're like deer in the headlights. That's what it, it causes. Once you're, it's like the guy that, you know, these people that came over from Russia and right after the fall of the wall and they came over to the U.S. and they went into a grocery store and, you know, uh, they, they just stood there looking at like they were just going to get a loaf of bread and they looked and there was a, you know, the whole aisle of bread. They had no idea what to do. And one of the guys was talking about it. his wife was with him and they went into the grocery store and they stood there looking at him and he, and he said his wife just wept because she had no idea even how to buy bread. You know, it's like that. And that happens sometimes when you get this, like, because I've had that happen where we got a huge exit to people that um, had lived, you know, relatively simple kinds of lives. And then they have all these complex, all these people chasing them for their money and the complexities that come from having the money and investing the money. And I always tell them, listen, keep your mouth shut about your sale. Don't tell anybody you're selling if you can help it. That's my personal advice because uh, life will be a lot easier for you. You un Unfortunately, when you... You keep growing the company and you'll find out that the world, you know, it narrows. You get less and less people that unfortunately will be your friends. And so the fewer you have, uh, the fewer people you let know that if you've been, if you're being pretty successful as much as possible, you know, you either decide to keep it secret as you can or you embrace it. But if, but whichever one you're going to do, there's going to be a division when you do, I'll tell you, because, um, you know, like you, you got all this money. Oh, we're going to go to Tahiti, you know, Tahiti for a month. You guys want to come? Well, uh, that eliminates a whole bunch of people, you know, right there. So it, it, it can be divisive uh, of friends and family. And so I say as much as possible, keep it close to the best. That's my, my opinion. Absolutely. Uh, do we have any questions from quick questions of the audience? Anybody have any questions? Let me just ask, Mark. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know how in-depth you're going to get on any particular topic, but um, this, is, this has been helpful, so thank you. But, like, do you guys ever advise anybody on actually acquiring businesses? Mark, Mark um, and I have had conversations over the, the um, past year. Quick quick story about me. So we I bought a business last year that I'm actually – uh, Randy sh just shutting down because um, I just don't want to do it anymore. Um, I made a little bit of money out of it, learned a lot. You know, I've, I've talked to Mark a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the wheelhouse of what we do from a real estate investment standpoint, personally. Um, but interestingly enough, it's just a business I just didn't want to continue for other people. I, you know, we're going to continue to do what we did. 
but I turned it around quite well. And I, you know, made it profitable very quickly by the end of the summer. We bought it in April, all the different things. Um, but it was, you know, my radical approach definitely, you know, scared a lot of clients off and all the things. And I'm cool with all that. However, it was interesting because I, I think um, what I would like to con potentially pursue is actually acquiring companies of, I, I don't know if it was you, Ellen, or you, Randy, who said, you know, like maybe it was the electrical guy who's just like, I'm, I'm fucking done. Like, I just, I don't care about selling it. I just want to, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So right. like, but what's interesting is I know, I know why I shut it down. I, I made pretty quick decisions, but I know, I know what it feels like to be like, I, I just don't care anymore. And, and, and naturally it's not that you're necessarily trying to take advantage of someone, but the reality is you, you can get things for pennies on the dollar by tapping into that emotion where you're still helping them out. Like they don't want it anymore and they don't want to go through a grueling three-year perpetual setup process. And so the short question here is, you know, do you guys actually ass assess or help coach people looking to acquire businesses and then turn them around and then make them profitable or more profitable and then sell them? Because I talked to Mark about that as I'm going through a transition of what I want to do next, um, in addition to my investing, is that seems like an interesting option for me, but I don't know if you guys do it from that angle too. Yeah. Some of our clients, um, part of the growth strategy is acquisitions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been true. I've, I've worked on acquisitions my whole career. Um, it's for the smaller businesses, it's, just, it's not as, it's not as normal on the smaller end as it is in the mid markets. In the mid markets, there's lots of acquisition work, you know? Um, and then we had like one of the companies we sold towards this at the end of last year in December, we had rolled, I don't know, seven, nine something um, companies into the company that we were advising. So we ended up with, um, they had acquired over the course of a couple of years, we were working with them. We'd have gone through, I think, three or uh, maybe five acquisitions. And then we rolled another seven or so together at the same time of the close. And so we got a huge exit out of it. So acquisitions is a great strategy. If you have good tax advice, you know your operational side well, right? So if you don't know the business yourself, then you need to have people understand integration. And uh, so it depends on same thing. You can do it. Uh, you can do it with the team if you have people already in place, or if you're really good. So um, it's recognizing the value of the of the company you're purchasing. They're the financial value, if you will. Then there's the people judgment side and integration and how's everything going to work together. Or if you're just buying a company first and then you're, um, or if you're adding, you're, you know, bolting one onto you, or you're just kind of, you're moving your small company into a bigger one because you're buying a, actually a bigger company. It, so it depends on what the strategy is. Um, but uh, a lot of acquisitions go well. And a lot of them, even with super, super big companies, a lot of them don't go well. Mm -hmm. So, so even with the best minds in the world, so Matt, man, um, marrying culture, to me is one of the most important pieces so that the people don't feel like, so if you were, I'll, I'll give an example. So if you're, uh, I, I had one of these. So one of my companies um, was in the, the fruit industry. So this is years ago. And um, we, we went to sale and the company that we ended up selling to was Cargill. Do you know who that is? Mm -hmm. Big, right, the biggest grain um, owner in the, uh, or uh, marketer, all that stuff in, in the U S at the time. I don't know what they are still, but those guys came and I'll never forget. We're in our big table, you know, around and they, the, the we're signing and there's like five MBAs at the table and you know, their lawyers and all this kind of stuff. And, and my farmers <laughs> working with. And so I tell these guys, listen, um, Cargill, I said, done my work on Cargill. Cargill has never run a company that was uh, fresh fruit or fresh anything, you guys all do grains and, you know, finish stuff. And I said, what you do not want to do is presume that you know more than these people about their business. So as an example, you better not come in here and have your MBAs decide that they're going to change the inventory system until they actually know how inventory works in fresh fruit because it's very complicated. And of course, they chuckled, you know, and they came in and they changed the inventory management system. And two years later, Cargill sold that to another one of my clients for 10 cents on the dollar. 
Yeah. It was, right? So you, you see my point? Yeah. yeah. But to answer your question, we don't go find businesses to acquire. We are not in the broker or the M&A business, but in terms of strategy, in terms of, you know, helping you as a business owner build your business. Yeah. We've been a part of a lot of our clients have bought or rolled up or, you know, there's even a strategy of you don't even buy those companies. You almost, you find other companies like yours to kind of almost like sort of merge together into an exit to a bigger company. So at the end of the day, we're, we're just working with leverage, right? How do we move up in, we haven't talked about this, but there really are tiers in the selling your business. And so if we can move from a bottom tier to a middle tier, a middle tier to a bigger tier, the, the multiples on those can be exponential. So, you know, you might have, again, just for purposes, but three to five, five to seven, seven to 10. Well, if I can go from a three X multiple to a 10 X multiple, because I combine a bunch of companies together, well, I'm going to get a really big return on that. So there, that's a whole like hour discussion on how sure. that all works. But, but yeah, I mean, I think we're not experts in the buying business, but we do help businesses grow their companies and, and rollups are a part of that. We've had a lot of our clients buy other companies. So as part of an overall strategy. And we have opinions and all those things, just like we do on the companies that we're growing. The, ultimately, the we, like we always say, ultimately, the owner is responsible for his company. He's responsible for his decisions. But we want him to understand. We want him to get the best advice possible. And we would tell him, we always say, we'll tell you what we would do if we were you. Because ultimately, to me, that's what advice is all about. Not just yeah. here's here's your seven options. Choose one. No. This is what I would do if I were you, and here's why. Even though these are the three options I think are possible, this is what I would choose, and this is why. And you can say, oh, I agree with that basis or that presumption, or, or I don't like it. I'll choose this one over here. So informed decision, informed decision, informed decision. But as you know, the, the buying, when you buy a company, the deal, it's a good deal or a bad deal the day you sign the company sign mm -hmm. the paperwork right so yeah. buying is really important whether it's a good buy or a bad buy but yeah. although i have seen i have seen people make bad buys and make them into good sales <laughs> you just got to work oh. a little a little bit harder That's right. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah sure. Mark, did you have something you want to say well no but we are uh uh I, we are out of time and i wish we had more time to rip on this but i really appreciate you guys coming in and also for any of our listeners and particular clients you know, reach out if you want to, you know, talk to Randy and Ellen a little more on this topic and they can help you in this process. Uh, Randy and Ellen, do you guys have a call to action or anywhere that you want people to go to connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah. Uh, if you go to the braveheartbusiness.com, uh, you can, there's a meet, meet with us or work with us and we just have a little survey. And uh, if you want to chat with us, get an hour in our calendar. If you fill that out, um, you can jump on and we're happy yeah. to help. So and, there's and, also a lot of videos that you can watch and, and buying the book, of course, go to Amazon, um, the bulletproof, wait, yeah. Bulletproof your exit. There. <laughs> bulletproof your exit. Um, buy that book is a great overview for people. Yeah. It's a 12 bucks. You can't lose on that one. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for, for, for giving us your time. They really great conversation here. So we all got to start thinking about our exits from day one. I'm already thinking about mine and how I'm going to phase out when I have white hair because I'll still have hair on my head. God willing. <laughs> and uh, if you want to learn more, you can connect with them. And obviously, if you need us, email me at markprobercpa.com. And also, I said I'm hiring, right? So you guys know anybody, I'm hiring. Send <laughs> your best CPA friends to us so we can hire them. All right. Have a good one. Thank you very much for your time. You or anyone you know is interested in using our services or would like to join our team, go to info at markperlbergcpa.com. Again, email info at markperlbergcpa.com.